All right, so I'm going to uh, show you a couple sample theses, and the goal here, again, is to kind of say, um, how do we get to the best possible thesis? So here's a random prompt um, for the Crucible. I'm kind of betting that you guys have read the Crucible last year, uh, but if you haven't, you'll still be able to get a sense of what we're looking for in a good thesis. Uh, so this prompt asks us to think about a character from the Crucible that has sacrificed, surrendered, or forfeited something in a way that highlights the character's value. And the goal here is to say, how this sacrifice shows us the character's values, okay? Um, so again, sacrifice and what it tells us about the character. The significance here is clear. It's not just identifying a sacrifice. It's also saying, here's why this matters. Here's the significance of it. All right, so here's the first thesis, and it's a bad one. In Arthur Miller's The Crucible, characters are often asked to sacrifice for the sake of others. Does it tell us what we're going to prove? No. Is there an argument here? No. This is just truth, right? This is just exactly what is true from the story. No one would disagree with this uh, because it's about as true as saying Arthur Miller's The Crucible is written with words. There's no argument here. It's just plot summary, and it's very, very broad. This is like a, a baby thesis. It's like cute and stuff. Um, but like, you don't want it to stay that. Well, I shouldn't say that. You do want that to stay forever. This is Finn. He's my dog. He's adorable. Anyway, here's the second one. In the Crucible, John Proctor's decision to die at the end of the play illuminates his character. All right. So what do we get here? We get a little things that are a little better. It's closer to argument. We get a sense that his decision to die is the thing that we're going to talk about. That's his sacrifice that we're discussing. Spoiler alert if you haven't read the play. It's still broad, though. Leaves a lot of questions. What scenes are we going to discuss? How does it illuminate his character? What aspects of the book are we looking at? All those things are still unclear. It's kind of like a, it's like an adolescent thesis, you know. Um, his uh, his his second coat is coming in here uh, a little bit. That's also, this is kind of a sad picture because it's a dog that is older than that now, but it's also in my Toyota Corolla, which I don't have anymore because I totaled it two weeks ago. Here's another one. In The Crucible, John Proctor achieves redemption by forfeiting his life to expose the hypocrisy of Salem. Okay, we got some better things here, right? Now we're talking about a clear argument that he's achieving redemption here. And the second point that we're now developing in our thesis about the hypocrisy of Salem. How could this even be more specific? Well, that's a good question. I think there's some room to change this thesis around a little bit. It's closer to argument though, right? Now we're talking about exposing hypocrisy. We're moving uh, the plot along in a uh, thoughtful and worthwhile way. That's just, I mean, you can't beat that picture. It's just the most adorable thing you've ever seen in your entire life. And if you disagree, <laughs> Okay, how about this one? In The Crucible, John Proctor achieves redemption through his sacrificial decision to fight for truth, forfeiting his life to expose the hypocrisy of Salem. Now, I've added even more to this, right? I've said not only does he achieve redemption, but it's through this decision to fight for truth, okay? Uh, so I'm basically, if I think about this as a mini outline, I'm talking now about a clear focus moving from uh, his decision about fighting for truth, which I'm going to have to discuss. I'm going to have to discuss the hypocrisy of Salem. And then I'm going to have to discuss how this uh, means redemption for John Proctor. All right. So it gives me some more pieces, gives me more argument, gives me more to uh, discuss than previous ones. It's like a full grown adult, uh, adult thesis that you can like take for a walk and talk about life with, you know, she hears some of Finn's opinions on things. It's really some brutal stuff he thinks. Okay, so I want to walk you through a little bit the uh, the rubric for this piece, okay? Um, hopefully some of the uh, rubric pieces will be familiar to you because uh, you've been graded on them before. But the first piece of the rubric is focus. What I'm looking for in this section is a clear thesis, something that tells me what you're going to prove and how you're going to prove it with corresponding significance. The significance part of this is very important. Moving forward, each paragraph is going to talk about your thesis. All parts of your paper are going to relate to your thesis, all right? There's going to be a clear sense that there's direction and intent in your writing. If it's uh, unfocused, if there's portions of the paper that don't have anything to do with the rest of the paper, uh, if you get caught in the weeds of plot summary or in uh, divergence on, uh, diver diversions on other things, you'll lose points on focus. If everything is cleanly aligned and there's a clear direction in the paper, uh, you'll do well on this section of focus. 
The next thing you'll be graded on is content. Again, we're thinking about a thesis-driven paragraph that supports the thesis. You're going to give good details that are fully explained in the paper. This is uh, where you'll get credit for using primary and secondary quotes. Primary quotes are from Macbeth. Secondary quotes are that other source. Your analysis will be... Uh, will be graded here as well, that you're thinking in a high, uh, high level way, and uh, that you're putting forward thoughtful insights, you're avoiding plot summary, you're looking towards significance in all of your paragraphing. Organization is a big part of this as well. Um, I very much encourage you to discuss the work chronologically. So start at the beginning and move to the end and make sure please that you talk about the end of the play. I've read many, many papers on Macbeth that end at Act 3. And if you end at Act 3, you're going to lose points across the board, but you'll definitely lose points uh, on this section of the rubric. You got to talk about the whole play. You can't talk about what Macbeth is like in the beginning and not consider what he's like at the end. So the whole play needs to be discussed uh, in this piece. If you follow chronologically, it's more likely that your paragraphs will build on each other, but that needs to be a part of this as well, that there's intentional movement from one paragraph to the other, that it's clear that this had to be talked about before this could be talked about, before this last idea could be talked about, right? Uh, strong intro, smooth transitions, and strong conclusion are also a part of the rubric for organization. You'll also be graded on your style. So I want to see formal academic voice, uh, something that suggests uh, care and intent. And I'm noticing here that I've written formal academic voice twice, uh, which I wouldn't take off in style. I'd take off in conventions, um, but I give myself a bad grade for that. Uh, I want to see that you're uh, trying to vary your sentence structure, that it's not just this kind of like boring, every sentence is the same, uh, but you're trying to have some kind of marriage between an academic voice and your own voice. And then finally, you'll be graded on conventions, uh, that there's really in conventions, I'm just looking for some thoughtful proofreading. If there's obvious errors in punctuation, spelling, uh, if there's a bunch of grammatical bumps that makes it seem like you didn't even hit spell check on your word processor or check for grammatical errors, uh, then you'll lose big points here. Um, if there's uh, errors in citation, um, etc., you'll lose points here as well.